God made three great promises in the Old Testament. The first promise was made to Abraham. It was a simple covenant. God promised Abraham, you will become the father of a multitude of nations. You will be my people, and I will be your God. And from there, the notion of a chosen people arose. The next great covenant was made with Moses. Moses led the people out of slavery in Egypt, and he received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And God promised Moses, if you follow these commandments, then you will be blessed. But if you do not follow them, then you will be cursed. This was a conditional covenant because it was conditioned on the people following the commandments of God in order to receive the promised blessings. The third great covenant of the Old Testament was made to King David. It's the covenant we read about in today's first reading. David was the first king to unite all 12 tribes of Israel under one authority. There was finally peace throughout the kingdom, and David was living pretty good in his grand palace in Jerusalem. And so he decided that it was only right for him to build God a grand house as well, to build God a temple. At first, when David tells his plans to the prophet Nathan, Nathan concurs with him. But later, God speaks to Nathan and tells him of God's own plans. God reminds Nathan and David that it was God who called David from the pasture to lead the people. It was God who accompanied David and defeated the people's enemies. And it will be God who secures the people in their homeland. And so in essence, God says to David, you think that you're going to build me a house? No, my friend. It will be I who build you a house. And this house would not be a building made of stone and wood. This house would be a dynasty. God promises David that a member of his family would rule over the people Israel forever. And this wasn't a conditional promise either. David did not have to meet any conditions in order for this promise to be fulfilled. God made the promise to David outright. A member of the house of David will rule as king forever. Period. Now, it was David's son Solomon who ultimately built a grand temple for God. 
But unfortunately, the reign of the house of David did not fare so well. Soon after Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel split in two as the sons of Solomon argued among themselves over power. The northern kingdom became known as Israel, and it was ultimately destroyed by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom became known as Judah, and it was from Judah that the house of David ruled but ever over a very tiny and divided kingdom. And eventually, Judah itself was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the reign of the house of David came to an end. The people were sent into exile and even though they eventually returned to Israel, a legitimate member of the house of David never ruled over Israel again. Their kings were puppet kings, installed by foreign powers, whether they be the Persians, the Greeks, or ultimately the Romans. And that was the scene when the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Mary and Joseph and all the people of Israel would have known about God's promise to King David, about how a member of the house of David was to rule over Israel forever, about how that rule came to an end with the Babylonian exile, and how with the Romans now firmly in place, that rule would seem never to be established again. Mary would have known that many of her kinspeople were wondering whether God had broken his promise to David and ultimately to the people. Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary would have immediately understood what God was up to. God was about to fulfill the promise to David, and she would be the one to bear the member of the house of David who would rule over Israel forever. How can this be, she asked, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. 
and perhaps in one of the most important lines in all of Scripture, the angel tells her, for nothing will be impossible for God. Now, most of us, I would imagine, hear that and assume that the angel's reference is to Elizabeth bearing a son in her old age and to Mary bearing a son as a virgin. And indeed, those are two great miracles. But those two miracles are placed in the context of a larger miracle that God was about to fulfill the promise he made to David. The fulfillment of that promise made a thousand years before and lying fallow for centuries seemed every bit as impossible to the people as the conception of children by Mary and Elizabeth. But for God, nothing will be impossible. And when it comes to the fulfillment of God's promises, nothing will keep God from fulfilling his promises. Even if a virgin has to conceive and bear a son in order for him to do so. You see, that's what is really at work here. This story is not fundamentally about God's power to conceive a child in a virgin. This story is fundamentally about God's power to fulfill his promises, no matter what. And once we understand that, then we no longer have any reason to doubt any promise made by God ever again. If we call ourselves Christian, if we dare to profess faith in Jesus Christ, then we have no reason to doubt the promises of God. Because part and parcel of being a Christian is believing that God length to fulfill his promise to King David, even to the point of having a virgin conceive and bear a son. So that as we come to the end of this Advent season, as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, as we look forward to his coming at the end of time, we believe in the promises of God. We believe that God remains with us as a parish community, despite all our challenges and all our hardships in this last year. Because God promised that th through Jesus Christ, that whenever two or more are gathered in his name, there he will be. God promised that. And we believe that God will establish peace and justice in our world, despite the divisions of race and class and power that plague our society. Because God promised through Jesus Christ that he would leave us peace. Not the peace that the world gives, but the peace that can come only from believing in the only begotten Son of God. God promised that. And we believe that God will give us eternal life despite the physical death we experience here on earth. Because God has promised through Jesus Christ that he has prepared a place for us and that he will come back to us and take us to himself so that where he is, we might also be. God promised us that. And nothing 
nothing will be impossible for God, except perhaps one thing. The only thing impossible for God is for God to break his promise. God made three great promises in the Old Testament to Abraham, to Moses, and to David. And God has kept every one of those promises. Advent may be coming to an end, but we still live in a world in which our fundamental cry continues to be, Come, Lord Jesus, come. And as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior, we rejoice in the fact that he has already come once among us. And so we have every reason to believe that he will come to us again. For nothing, nothing will be impossible for God. Amen.